I would say, as someone who wants to be an ally, I'm a white woman. I would like to be an ally for folks who I work with who are people of color is let's get real as white people about our racism. Up until a couple of years ago, I thought I carried no racism and I've had to learn that indeed I do. And so I think we white folks have a lot of work to do. We have to dig deep and do the serious reading, the serious exploration and hold the courageous conversations, not only with people of color, but with each other where we challenge each other and we talk about this. You just heard from Trish Foster, the executive director at the Center for Women and Business at Bentley University, talking about allyship and the importance of having courageous conversations. Hi there, I am Celeste Headley. Welcome to Women Amplified from the Conferences for Women. This podcast brings you great conversations with some of the most brilliant minds out there, offering you invaluable advice and a little bit of inspiration to help you make your way through your life, both at home and in your career. This episode is especially timely as the nation faces a tipping point around race, gender, and power. Managers, team members, organizations, we're all searching for tools and skills to help us mobilize and create necessary change within our work lives and communities. Today, Trish Foster is joined by her colleague, Yaro Fong Olivares from Bentley University's Center for Women in Business to offer you a framework for having courageous conversations that allow us to change how we communicate so that power is equitably distributed. So let's get started. We're having conversations about race and gender and identity and power and how power intersects with all those other identity issues. And I wonder, is it a different conversation about power, depending on whether you're talking about race or gender? Does the conversation then change? That's a great question, Celeste. And I'm pondering, I think that power dynamics can always come into play in a courageous conversation, as can gender. I think that what we want to think about is that our intersectional identities all come into play when we're having a courageous conversation. And you have me thinking a lot about our role as allies in courageous conversations right now. I feel as though in this past year, particularly with so much difficult stuff happening out in the world, the global pandemic, and the economic crisis, and of course, Black Lives Matter and our renewed concern around racial justice, a lot of my courageous conversations have related to this. And in my efforts to serve as an ally, I've had some challenging conversations with people in my own organization about the need for policy and process changes in our hiring and our promotion of employees who might be marginalized, specifically people of color. And my experience in those conversations, when they've become difficult, hasn't been so much that the receivers are rejecting my views, as that I really need to bring them along on a journey to help them understand the experiences of our colleagues who, for instance, are Black. So the person maybe can't understand why my saying that we need to take some unique measures right now to ensure that people of color are okay and being recognized and that we are bringing renewed sensitivity to their promotion reviews, why that needs to happen. They might be having trouble understanding that and they're looking at the situation through a rigid HR process instead of through a human lens that reflects a culture of care and a culture of inclusion. Oh, absolutely. So, Yara, we have been doing bias training in workplaces and in schools for a very, very long time. We've been doing diversity and inclusion workshops and trainings for a very, very long time. And at this point, there's no evidence that they work. Why do you think that is? Hmm. Another great question. I wouldn't say that there is no evidence that they work. I think the mere establishing of 
educational opportunities for employees around diversity and inclusion sends a message, especially when it's coming from the top and leadership, right? So for example, while we may not be able to concretely and perhaps quantitatively measure the impact of DNI education, we also know that having foundation and having opportunities for all employees to level set around their expectations of inclusivity and how they're going to work across difference is important and critical. I don't necessarily fully agree with what some think is a lack of success around DNI education. Perhaps I'm biased because that's what I do. And at the same time, I have again and again delivered sessions and been astounded with the beginning conversation and then where we land by the end and where people take it, right? And Sometimes it's about the culture, sometimes it's about the values, sometimes it's about the interpersonal relationships and the mission of the organization. So I would say, rather than thinking about sort of how successful or not, my sense is we have to start thinking about how it connects to the business, how it connects to the culture, how it connects to the longer term, and then taking it from there. And then, of course, making sure that the DNI efforts are supported as Trish mentioned earlier, with other systems in the organization, education is not enough. We have to think about processes, everything from how we're posting our job postings and who we're bringing in for interviews to exit interviews and the employee journey, so to speak. And that sounds, Trish, like the courageous conversation isn't just about values. It isn't just aimed to change people's values, but you're talking about concrete changes in procedures and policies. Is that accurate? Yes, courageous conversations are a phenomenal tool to bridge divide of all kinds for individuals in an organization, right? That might mean discussions across gender difference. It might mean discussions across racial difference or, as we've already said, across power difference. They allow people not only to bridge divide and connect with one another, but they allow the person who initiates the conversation to unburden themselves of critical concerns that are impacting their ability to work authentically and productively. Yaro, how do you get past the sometimes competitive nature of some of these conversations? And by that, I mean, I'm 50 years old. I've been in workplaces a lot. I have heard conversations in which one person will say, well, this is what I'm going through at this workplace that I feel is unfair or that is painful to me. And someone else will say, well, I'm also going through something painful and this is what's happening to me. How do you stop that kind of escalation? Yeah, I think a couple of thoughts around that. One, when we talk about sort of success factors for having courageous conversations, thinking about how we manage difference or conflict is a piece of that. And some of us are a competing style. So we are advocates. We tend to go and try to advocate for our own opinions. And some folks may be avoiding and don't want to have the conversation with us, right? So there is that piece of sort of the interpersonal and the individual preference. And then I think the second piece that you're touching on, which is something that I'm really interested in, is sort of the workplace competition that naturally happens and that sometimes is unnamed. And we couple that with a natural ambition that we all bring to the workplace. And I always try to bring home the point that this is not a quote-unquote oppression Olympics. We are not competing to step over one another. We are rather creating a bigger table, so to speak, so that we can all achieve our ambitions, so that we can all have inclusive, equitable workplace in which we can all thrive, right? And so going back to courageous conversations, a lot of the time, these conversations are really just a dialogue that happens in which I get to have a conversation with Trish about my experience and actually listen with empathy to her experience, right? Part of the framework and why it is a courageous conversation is that I have to be willing as someone who experienced, in my view, an offensive behavior or statement, I have to be willing to actually listen to Trish's experience as well, or the other person's experience as well, from an empathy and understanding perspective, rather than just me trying to shame or blame, et cetera, right? We are all human. We're all in the workplace together. And similarly, part of the conversation framework is accepting a lack of closure and understanding that we need to continue these types of conversations to truly undo bias. It is not a one-shot deal. And so how do we maintain trust? How do we maintain openness? 
how do we go deeper than the traditional sort of workplace performance feedback conversation is a big part of this. And by no means am I saying that this is easy or something that you can start to do with someone after three months of working with them, but it is ideal in terms of creating more equitable workplaces. How important is it to have complete honesty in a courageous conversation? And I ask that because there's pretty much no one who's going to say, yes, I am in fact a racist. David Duke, formerly of the KKK, says he's not racist. And the same is true of sexism, right? It's rare that you're going to find somebody to say, yes, I'm sexist. So to what extent is it necessary that someone not only see, but also accept the fact that their actions may have been racist or sexist in order to have these conversations go forward? Wonderful. Celeste, I feel as though I would love to divide your question into two parts. You started by asking, you know, to what extent can we truly be honest in a conversation? How do we make that happen? Because it's so hard. And by the way, it can apply to conversations across race, but it can apply to conversations across all kinds of difference. The first thing I would say is that if we show up not only authentically and consequently honestly, yet also bring other qualities to that conversation, compassion and care and demonstrating that we are sharing our story. It's our viewpoint. We are not saying it is the right and the only viewpoint. We're not expressing our views as fact. That helps soften the blow, perhaps, for the other person. It makes it easier for that person across the table to hear us and to understand that what we're trying to do is explore difference with them and that we're then prepared and very much embracing their views. We want to hear their opinion, their lived experience that may be different from ours. So I think that's how we manage that challenge around honesty in these conversations. But then you specifically asked about racism and people denying that they're racist. I would say as someone who wants to be an ally, I'm a white woman. I would like to be an ally for folks who I work with who are people of color is let's get real as white people about our racism. Up until a couple of years ago, I thought I carried no racism, and I've had to learn that indeed I do. And so I think we white folks have a lot of work to do. We have to dig deep and do the serious reading, the serious exploration, and hold the courageous conversations, not only with people of color, but with each other, where we challenge each other and we talk about this. So, Yaro, let me give you an example of just a situation and explain how somebody might respond. I'm actually going to use a real situation that happened to me in my past. So let's say that one person who's highly qualified gets passed over for a promotion and then a younger, less qualified white person gets the promotion, passing over that person of color. That person of color goes to their manager and says, this was racist. I feel I've been discriminated against. If I'm the manager, how might you advise me to respond? Certainly very familiar, I would say, and not uncommon. So from my professional hat and experience, I would say trying to guide this person to be more specific and more attuned to where the specific biases might be and really trying to surface that. And a lot of the times that may be sort of unclear promotion criteria or embedded affinity bias, depending on who you are. And so that's one way to sort of validate and explore that so that I am as a manager supportive to that person and validating of that person's experience because it is their experience. From a more personal perspective, I would also try to figure out my role in that dynamic, right? As this person's manager, How have I colluded or gotten in the way of this person's progress as well? Have I been providing direct, honest, actionable feedback? A big challenge for folks who are supervising across difference, especially for women of color and Black women. Have I been providing the right informal guidance? A lot of these decisions in organizations are made because of relationships, opportunities for stretch assignments, et cetera, and really take responsibility for my role in that. So it would be a bit of a 
twofold. And so trying to explore how we move forward so that I don't lose that person and so that I can also make sure that it doesn't happen again. So then let's take that situation and flip it on its head and get your advice for the person of color and how they should approach this and have this conversation with their supervisor. Are there tactics they might use to prevent the conversation from escalating into conflict? Absolutely. And again, I have some personal experience around these types of conversations. And number one is you can start with accusation, right? The minute you say to someone, I experience racism or bias, you're already shutting down the conversation. You have to start with curiosity and inquiry. Can we talk about how I can make sure that this doesn't happen again? Can we unpack the decision? Can we discuss the steps that led to this? For example, start with my experience and how I feel and what I think I should have been doing or share what my expectations would have been and then take it from there. Because I think part of what we're talking about here is the interpersonal connection and the relational piece of that managerial relationship and making sure that my manager knows that I'm not accusing them of being racist. Rather, there is embedded racism in every organization by the nature of our history. And so I would approach it from that perspective. And then I would come in open and ready to explore more concrete ways and more concrete data points around where bias might exist, right? So can I make sure to see the criteria, as I said earlier in my point. So Trish, I wonder why you think this is so hard. And I'm thinking of in recent news, you have a company like Wells Fargo, which has had language supporting diversity and inclusion for a very long time. And then you have the CEO saying they don't have a lot of people of color in management because there aren't enough qualified people of color, which is ridiculous. So why are these two things not matching? In one case, companies that for years and years and years have said they empathize with and value diversity, and yet on the other end, when the rubber hits the road, the company itself is not often diversified, especially in its upper echelons. Why? One of the biggest issues is that the focus is on diversity and not inclusion, right? And we all know that you can have diversity. You can increase the numbers of people you're bringing in at the front end of your organization. But if you are not inclusive, authentically inclusive, you lose those people because they feel it. And that's what we see in the data and in our experience working with companies is that a lot of companies will say, wow, we have really increased our numbers in terms of bringing in more people of color, more women, more people with disabilities, more people with unique identities across the board. And yet... By the time we get to the first, second, third levels of management promotions, we've lost them. You have to take a really hard look at your culture. And as Jado has already said, your programs, your processes, this has to be a multifaceted, comprehensive endeavor to become more authentically diverse and inclusive organizations. And then, of course, to leverage that to make the organization more productive and more successful. And there are folks who are doing it well and who are making significant progress, yet there are also, as we all know, many businesses that are still at the early stages and perhaps still not doing the hard work that's necessary to make the progress, really taking a look at their culture and saying, you know, are we truly being inclusive? Are we introducing programs and policies and behaviors that will really make people feel like they have a voice and like they belong, no matter what their identity? So I wonder, Yaro, how often do people confuse inclusion with covering? In other words, that here's our culture, and successful inclusion means everybody should cover the parts of their personality and work habits that don't fit into our existing culture. Is it common for that mistake to be made? Hmm, That's a good question. I would say, I don't know that folks are fully aware if they are making similar assumptions. I think a lot of the time, you're right. A lot of folks feel, you know, we have folks who are really happy here. They stay for a while. Therefore, they must be happy here. And then there's no real acknowledgement that, yes, we may have certain implicit norms of our culture that are either forcing people out and within their first few years in the company or simply shutting down further and further those individuals of difference that may be coming into the workplace. 
I think now that we have gotten more real, to quote Trish, about the systemic piece of what we're talking about, that is not just interpersonal biases, we are starting to notice a lot more real discussion around what the implicit white cultural norms or even upper class cultural norms that are embedded in our organizational cultures, right? So everything from where folks are calling from. I have some folks who say someone is calling from their home office while someone else is calling from their pantry. Things like that are becoming more and more normalized. Again, it's not to shame. If you have your home office, great, enjoy it. But rather to acknowledge that not everyone is on the same footing. And so I do feel like, yes, we have some work to do and even teaching people what covering is. Some of it is about owning your own identities, even if those identities are the dominant identities, like being able to say, like Trish, again, I love working with Trish because again, it's owning, you know, I'm a white woman and that means some things. I also want to be an ally and I can use my privilege for good, quote unquote, and I own my identities and then we can work from that rather than pretending that those identities are not shaping our workplace experience, which is what happens a lot of the time. You're listening to a conversation with Trish Foster, the executive director at the Center for Women in Business at Bentley University, and Yarofon Olivares, the director for the Center for Women in Business and Executive Education at Bentley University. Tickets are still on sale, by the way, for the Massachusetts Conference for Women happening on December 10th. It features a lineup of brilliant and inspiring women, including Alicia Keys, Doris Kearns Goodwin, and Aquafina, among so many others. To learn more and register, visit conferencesforwomen.org. I'll be your MC for the day, and I really hope to see you there. Let's return to the conversation now. Trish, how might we recognize you guys work with various companies? And I wonder if there are ways to recognize a workplace in which courageous conversations are possible. That is a fabulous question. Recognizing a workplace in which courageous conversations are possible. The reason I love that, Celeste, is that they kind of work in tandem. Courageous conversations can help create cultures that are more inclusive. And by utilizing them and by weaving them into the fabric of the organization, the organization then becomes more inclusive. However, Going back to the premise of your question, I think is a more inclusive organization is certainly going to be able to ramp up with courageous conversations much more quickly and be able to start utilizing them much more rapidly and much more effectively. And so, for instance, if you think about the work we do, we go into companies and we help them learn about courageous conversations and how to utilize them. There are organizations we go into and they say, you know, we're already doing a pretty good job. We're already, for instance, holding listening sessions, which are different than a courageous conversation, but at least we're doing that. And we have fabulous turnout. People are moved by these listening sessions. That's a great indication that there's a thirst to utilize yet another tool such as courageous conversations. And then there are other companies that are doing none of this. And still well-intended, and we often refer to them as cultures of nice. People are, to some extent, masking. Everyone is, to some extent, masking. Treating each other politely, nodding their heads, saying yes to one another. And yet, behind the scenes, we know that there are differences that should be addressed and are not being addressed. And so, that's something to really consider as well when we look at this and we consider, can companies utilize this tool? Are they ready to embrace it and take it forward? Yara, what mistakes have you made in these conversations in the past? When has one of these conversations maybe not gone so well? Oh, so many mistakes. (laughs) A few sort of high level, not planning enough. So assuming that I can just sort of roll out of bed and go into this type of conversation and then being either surprised or taken off track because of my lack of preparation around it. My best failed courageous conversation story, if I may, really revolves around what I call feeling over familiarity with another Black woman in my workplace. She's African-American. I'm Latinx. So In my enthusiasm that we have brought in another Black woman, I was overly familiar with her and said something that was completely inappropriate. 
to her in front of our boss. And she, of course, was really upset. And certainly I took responsibility for that. And we decided to have a follow-up conversation. And when she told me all of that she experienced from what I did and how it impacted her, I completely shut down. I was so unprepared and to accept my own internalized anti-Blackness, right, even as a Black person, I was unable to put myself in her shoes and to really have the conversation. And so I always hold that. To this day, we're very, very close. And I have so much gratitude for her staying in with me and allowing me to have that experience and also the humility of, okay, I have done so much anti-racism work my entire career. And yet here I am committing this bias to someone that I really care about. And so from there, I would say, again, you have to manage your emotions. You have to be humble and realize that we are all working through bias and every interaction will surface something new. And that, again, part of our dynamic was that we were set up to be competitive with each other as the two only Black women. And I hadn't realized that, right? And she realized it earlier. And some of what transpired was about that. And so understanding that even as people of color, as Black women, as women, depending on the situation, we have some more to do among ourselves too, and that's part of the dynamic. I wonder, Trish, if you could also give advice on what to say when you get it wrong. And I'll give you an example just from my own experience that happened relatively recently. Just to underline, I am a Black, Jewish, Native American single mother. I mean, I check a lot of boxes, and yet I get it wrong all the time. One time I was on Zoom call with a whole group of us. I was trying to express to another female that I had something taken care of that she could take it off her checklist. And trying to be satirical, I said, don't you worry your pretty little head. That did not come off very well as a joke. And I then had to apologize to her, of course. Can you tell me what you would have told me to do? How would I apologize for the mistake I'd made? So Celeste, the first thing I would say is you're human. We're all human. As Jado already said, we all carry bias. And yet, in addition, we all make mistakes because of our human reality. And so one of the things that I fall prey to because of the way I'm wired, Celeste, is I'm very extroverted. I move fast. I sometimes speak before I think. And the example you just shared sounds like just that. Had you stopped and paused, I doubt that that would have come out, right? So that's those bias interrupters, by the way, that we all are constantly searching for for ourselves. I know a little bit about you and I know you would be, and I certainly know Jado and I are. So I definitely try to hit the pause button to think before I speak and before I act. However, the most important thing I do couldn't be more simple. And it's that I apologize. I own it. I let the person know that I realize I hurt them and try to make amends. Does it matter if you do it by email or do you need to get them either on Zoom or on the phone? In this remote world, it is so hard to find five spare minutes in our calendars to be able to come together and talk, isn't it? And yet I would say, if we can do it in person, we should. And again, in this remote world we're living in right now, I realize that means get on Zoom if possible. And if you can't, absolutely send a note, send a text, do what you can. So Trish, Yaro has talked about sort of both sides of the conversation when an instance of perceived bias or discrimination arises in the workplace. So let's say you are that employee and you're trying to explain to someone else, I think that what happened was racist or sexist or discriminatory in some way, and they're not listening to you. Maybe they're nodding, maybe they're saying, "Uh uh-huh, but you can tell they're not really hearing you. What then? Celeste, this is a question that resonates so deeply with me. It is something that when Jado and I facilitate Courageous Conversations workshops, we actually really focus on with attendees. I think every one of us who has adopted Courageous Conversations as a tool has experienced these moments where we have come with our authentic, full, honest, vulnerable selves to share a problem that we are having. And we see very quickly into the conversation that the person is just not with us. And remember, that doesn't mean that they disagree with us. It's okay to disagree with respect. It's that we can see they're either shutting down or they're defensive or they're angry. And we have a couple of options at that point. There are times when we can 
hit the pause button just for a moment in the conversation and address it and literally say, I think this is not going well right now. Can we regroup? Can we start over? And sometimes that works, but then there are times when it doesn't, right? Where we've tried it and we can see that the conversation is going to deteriorate. And not only are we not making progress, but if we are carrying a burden as the person who initiated the conversation, it's doing more emotional damage for us, right? We're doing even more emotional labor and it's hurting us. And if that's the case, there are moments where we have to say, I think we shouldn't proceed with this conversation. It might be that we can say, let's connect again in a week or two or a month. Let's find a better time. Or on rare occasions, sadly, it can be that for this person, the conversation is not going to work. So can the two of you demonstrate how a courageous conversation might go? Can you give us a demonstration? Of course. Absolutely. Thank you. So as as a framing, I'm going to be the initiator. And Trish, you'll be the receiver. Wonderful. Okay. Trish, first, I want to say thank you for taking the time to connect with me. I want to have a courageous conversation with you. And before I do that, I want to make sure that this is the right time for that. As you know, these conversations take a little bit more energy than than the typical workplace conversation. We've had them before. So I want to make sure this is still a good time for that. It is. And thanks for checking, Jado. Sure. And I want to acknowledge that This is something that I've been thinking about for a few weeks and have debated on whether or not to check in with you about because part of me feels like this is something perhaps silly. I'm not sure, but we have a working relationship that I want to preserve and I want to continue to build on that. And so I'm just going to share with you an experience I had and check in with you and your experience or if you even remember. I know we're moving so fast, especially right now. A couple of weeks ago, we were having a conversation about our weekly team connect and we were talking about cheese and I heard you say something along the line of Brie, it's rich people's cheese. You wouldn't know anything about that. I was kind of taken aback by that statement. I think it was a response to me asking what was in your plate or something like that. I don't honestly remember. I just remember the statement or something like that. And I want to just check in with you about that and one, make sure that I didn't mishear you and to explore that comment because it didn't sit well with me and I've been carrying it since that time. Jado, I am pausing for a moment to gather my thoughts and I want you to know that's all I'm doing right now and that's why I'm not responding quickly. I do remember. And of course, I wish I didn't remember. And the first thing I need to say to you is I am really sorry. And I did not mean to hurt you. And just hearing you say the words, and of course, which jogged my memory, makes me realize how insensitive it was. Can I ask your permission to talk a little bit more about why I think I did that? Although I want to be clear that I'm not making excuses. I would love to learn more. Thank you, Trish. Okay. Thanks, Jado. So, in brief, I think that you know that you and I both do. We kid around together a lot and we work so closely together that my comfort level with you is high. And so I do think, number one, I don't filter enough perhaps with you in general, meaning I don't pause and think is what's coming out of my mouth sensitive right now. And you know me, you know I am an extrovert and I move too fast often and certainly often think before I speak anyway. And I literally, in the moment, the thought came to me and I thought it was a joke. And I never thought about the layers behind that of the experiences you've had in your life and why that could have been offensive. And again, this is to try to explain to you, it's not to make an excuse, but I hope that helps a little bit. And I guess the more important thing I need to tell you is thank you for bringing it to me. And I hope that we can maybe continue to have discussions like this around our difference and perhaps both grow some more from it. Although again, I'm owning this one, Jado. It's on me and I'm sorry. Thank you, Trish. I appreciate your apology. And I love to continue conversations like this. I'm sure things like this will come up for me as well. So thank you. You're welcome. 
essentially one thing that we underscore with courageous conversations is that you do have to have dialogue. It's not enough to end at the apology. That's part of ensuring that there is learning and undoing of bias. If we just say sorry and out of sight, out of mind, then chances are things like this will continue to be said and done, right? That's the longer term outcome of these conversations. I don't know if you think it's necessary, but I don't know, especially since Trish and I demonstrated sometimes participants question, are we making excuses? Are we allowing for excuses? No, we are exploring difference together because we don't know for Trish, it's that she thought it was a joke. For somebody else, it's like, you know what? I grew up in a poor family and that was a joke we said. So it just creates a little bit more texture. Yaro and Trish, thank you both so much. Thank you. This has been wonderful. It really has been, Celeste. Thank you. That was Bentley University's Trish Foster and Yaro Fong Olivares, the Executive Director and Director of the Center for Women in Business. To learn more about Courageous Conversations and further your own work in DNI, go to bentley.edu and visit the Center for Women in Business. If you enjoy this podcast, and I sure hope you do, share it with others. We could all benefit from some inspiration and uplift and good advice right about now. The Conferences for Women is the largest network of women's conferences in the nation. They draw more than 45,000 women and men to annual events in Boston, Philadelphia, Austin, and Silicon Valley. You can learn more at conferencesforwomen.org. I'm Celeste Headley. This is Women Amplified from the Conferences for Women. Thank you so much for listening. It's a tough time out there. Be kind and be well. <laughs>